Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm here today with Kristen Connor, who has been an enterprise sales rep at Three Unicorns, and she also coaches sales reps. Kristen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. I'm excited to, to talk with you. Now, Kristen, I got um, became aware of the work you're doing uh, from one of your posts on LinkedIn, which someone else had reshared or liked and commented on. And it was quite well done, very engaging post. And you are really crushing it with your LinkedIn content strategy. And when I kind of scrolled back over your posts back in time, uh, you know, earlier ones were getting a more, you know, modest, you know, 10 or 15, 20 likes and a few comments. But today you're getting you know, 350, 400 likes, you're getting 60, 70, 100 plus comments, really quite extraordinary, um, particularly compared to like the size of your following, which you have something like, I don't know, 15,000 followers. So you're really getting excellent engagement. And I'd love to hear a bit first just about your content strategy for LinkedIn. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's definitely something that has evolved, and it's also something that I've spent um, a lot of time and um, and some money on. Um, the like, so I've taken three. Actually, I think I've taken four different courses um, on like utilizing, like finding your voice on LinkedIn, and then really a content strategy, and then like how to be a better like writer or copywriter. Um, Justin Welsh has two different amazing courses. One is basically like finding your voice on LinkedIn. The second one is basically like content strategy. Um, Austin uh, Belsack or Belchak uh, did a free like LinkedIn masterclass. He has a million followers, which is crazy. Um, And then um, and then the last one that actually I just wrapped up doing recently is really just how to like how to be a good digital writer um and write like for engagement and um and it definitely took off during that time and that is the um ship 30 course they they do and they have a ton of free resources online too so if you want to if people want to check them out and kind of get an idea of what they're about before they pay for it that's that's definitely what i did what are some of your key lessons learned from this investment you've made in your own skills as a writer what are some of the key principles of digital writing yeah um i would say like find your niche um and and you'll you're gonna have to experiment with it right sometimes you're gonna have to find what doesn't work before you find what does work um and i would say understand all of the courses that i took really talk about like how to make your writing punchy and um and with and to write for how people read um it, it, it yeah it's, it's just, and it's also like kind of the a side benefit of that is it helps me as i'm as i still am a rep it helps me in uh demos and conversations with customers to be more succinct and to think it helps me i think writing helps you think uh more clearly and so it, it kind of helps you everywhere well what i've noticed about yours is uh at least the ones now they f- seem to follow a similar kind of layout or design where you you typically will start out with this one kind of punchy, uh, intention-grabbing headline. Like, I was an AE at three unicorns, and here's, you know, a mistake that I used to make, or here's three things to to do when you're, or here's three things they don't teach you at the big firms. It's it's always kind of like this attention-getting headline to try to grab people in. Talk, Talk to me about how you play with those, refine those, get to those, you know, do you test out a bunch of ideas or walk me through how you came up with that, uh, that kind it, of a design and approach? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, when you take LinkedIn courses, that's one of the first things that they'll talk to you about is like making sure is that every sentence is an advertisement for the next sentence. And that when people read things online, they read quickly. And what you are asking them to do is trade a part of their time for, you know, they're spending part of their time with your content. So every line has to kind of lead them to the next line. And one of the things that they talked about in this, um, in this last class that I took that I think made the the biggest difference, there's like two things. First is um, that you, um, you have to 
basically state your credibility. And I think the first thing that I wrote that went really viral, that was whenever I started by saying, you know, for four years as an enterprise rep, you know, five years in tech sales or, you know, and three unicorns and here's, you know, and, you know, here's X, Y, or Z. Um, and that's, it just took off. And that's where I realized, I think the difference between what, how I was positioning it is I wasn't giving, I wasn't telling people up front like why they should listen to what came next. Um, Cause it be, and then the other thing that I realized after watching kind of the theme of what people were responding to is uh, sales rep, people want to be taught and taught in specifics, not taught in concepts. Um, sales people get a ton of training around just like general concepts. You should multi-thread. You should run good discovery. You should get to the decision maker. But they are very rarely given examples of how to precisely go about doing that in the roles they have. So after a bunch of testing and refining in these courses, what now would you say is your target audience? Who are you writing for? And what are the topics that you're writing about? Yeah, I would say the, the, our, the audience is really um, early stage account execs. Um, and then a lot of times it's SDRs or BDRs that, that want to be AEs someday. And they're, it's mostly coming from like smaller companies where they don't get a lot of training um, and even some larger companies where it's just like a reinforcement of the good practice, like the best practices they already know. Like to me in sales, so much of it is 101, but it's just re remembering all of the 101s like all of the time. Um, and so some, for those reps that are at big or really good organizations, sometimes it's just a reminder of the, the things that they already know that they should be doing. And for those who aren't necessarily familiar with those acronyms or even spelled out, not exactly sure oh, what yeah. those roles do, what's the difference yeah. between a, an account exec and a, an SDR, which I guess is sales development representative, and a BDR, which yeah. I guess is business development? Or, yeah. What do those different roles do? Yeah. Thanks for the, uh, the clarification on the vocabulary. I get, I'm in SaaS sales, so people I forget. People always know. So, yeah, so the, an SDR or BDR role is, is generally like the first person that is going to um, reach out to the customer. So if you think about a salesperson like cold calling, um, you know, email, doing a lot of email prospecting, like that is what people do in those roles. And then many times then, it, then once um, somebody agrees to take a demo um, or agrees to like have a, like, a, like a first conversation, then that gets handed off. Um, to an account executive who is then responsible for um, helping kind of um, educate and create kind of demand and then run the deal all the way to a closed deal. Okay, got it. Talk to me about some of the you know areas of content that you're speaking to that audience about. So you, you, you mentioned that sort of in general they want to be taught, but like what do you have sort of three or four or five or seven different kind of content areas that you're focusing on? Um, what I'll tell you what's like been what's gotten the most like response and, and interest is uh, it's first um, discovery calls. Like that's your first call with um, an organization and it is so hard to do that well uh, where you're asking good business questions good open-ended questions um, and you are helping them think um, not just like show up show up and throw up where you just show up and tell them a bunch of information about your product but you're really getting them to think about what might be better in their own organization and it's just I don't think reps are really sales reps are really taught that very well they're taught to ask a bunch of product related questions versus like business questions um, and that's, that's actually the second kind of piece of the content that, um, people really respond to is like the training that I was very lucky to get on like how to have a conversation with an executive. Um, these are the business problems executives care about. Most of the training that reps get is around the product. It is not around 
how does this apply to someone at a VP level who is going to sign your deal? Talk to me about your advice around um, getting that discovery conversation about sort of identifying potential decision makers and then ways to approach that person. Yeah, so um, the, the best way that I have found is to kind of back into it. So, you know, in sales, you're, you're always thinking about like, these are the three main things that, you know, my, my product solves. And so then um, coming at it from then going like the finding the 10 impacts of each of, of not solving each problem. And then understanding who who does that impact affect? Does it affect a manager? Does it affect a director? Does it affect a VP? And so as you have different calls with people at different levels of the organization, they are going to feel that the impact of that problem differently. So a manager is going to care about how their team is performing. They're really not, their day-to-day problems are not risk and market share. But when you talk to a VP, they are not thinking about how their West Coast uh, small business sales team is performing. What they care about is risk and market share and um, and their accountability um, to investors. And so just understanding who you have on the call and how that conversation sounds different based on who you have on the call. What are some advice that you have on reaching out to that decision maker once you've identified those people um that's one of the hardest things and so many people are getting bombarded now by you know cold outreach on linkedin by email what are some of the tips that you have to break through that noise and get someone interested to get on the phone yeah um the the overarching principle is is it is never about us it is always about them if we are starting an email with I or we or our company does, that is the wrong way to start it. People don't care. They don't know you. Um, and so it is always about them. And because people are bombarded, the first thing that you have to do is stand out. And one way that you can do that is by personalizing things and personalizing it by in showing them that you have actually done the research about them personally you mentioned if they're an executive sometimes they will have been on a podcast something sometimes they will have written an article sometimes they will have published something on LinkedIn sometimes they um, volunteer for an organization and if people spend their time to volunteer somewhere they must care about that Um, and then taking the time to mention to notice something about that and then to then tie it back to the reason that you are um, reaching out or the, re- uh, the way that you think that it can help them. Um, also, most of the time people are looking at emails on their phones. And so if someone has to scroll to read everything you wrote, like you are doing it wrong and you will lose them. Uh, and no, and the last thing is, is that the, the phone is the least noisy channel. If, if you think about just in your day to day life, how many, emails you get versus how many texts you get versus how many voicemails you get you might get one or two voicemails a day people get dozens of texts and emails if not if not hundreds of emails depending on your position like the phone is the least convenient it is the hardest it is the most intimidating and it is the least noisy channel to get someone's attention well talk to me about that about your advice of just calling someone's phone and which is kind of intimidating to do. A lot of us wouldn't want to get calls, inbound calls. So do you recommend people just call someone's phone directly with no kind of pre, you know, vetting or permission? Uh, Talk to me about that. Well, I mean, if you are, um, I mean, if you are in sales, like your job is to get a hold of someone and, and pique their interest in your product and yes you are like interrupting their day that is part of the job but also like most people most of the time they're not going to pick up because they don't recognize your number they might and you should be ready for that 
Um, but most of the time they're not going to pick up because they don't recognize your number. Um, and so you should have a very tight, uh, scripted message that you leave. And, and I would say Josh Braun has some great, um, cold calling or, you know, cold calling scripts where he basically says like, you know, Hey, Will, I saw this is the kind of business you're in. I've got two ideas um, on how you might improve X, Y, or Z. Hey, this is, and this is Kristen Connor. Uh, this is my cell number. And I, no need to call me back. I'll send you an email with more detail. So, like, the voicemail is an advertisement for the email to go that goes into more depth. You're not asking them to call you back. They're probably not gonna, going to anyway, but it's just a way to stand out. Um, and, and calling and like leaving a LinkedIn um, voice message is also like kind of unusual. People people might you know send you a message on LinkedIn, but they, it's not often like a voice message or a video message. So that's definitely a way to to stand out as well. And um, I can't remember who said it, but basically somebody I think it might have been Zig Ziglar, I, but I can't remember. But they were saying if you sell something that you believe in and you really believe it can help people and solve their problems, you have a moral obligation to tell them about it. And, uh, and I also, I believe that people aren't aware of everything that's out there. I'm helping them be aware. My stuff is not for everyone, but I owe it to them to tell them. And I think it's easier to make those calls if you really believe in, in what you're selling. And so where would people, you know, get those, get that contact information? Do you like Zoom info or one, another resource such as that? Um, so definitely a lot of um, data providers out there. If you, you connect with folks on LinkedIn, um, if, if you're a first degree connection, you can leave someone like a voice message. And that's really probably um, the easiest way to go about it uh, because people, um, lots of times, Zoom Info and other data providers have old information that's not correct, and so you might be paying for bad information. But if you spend the time to personalize um, an email or personalize a connection request on LinkedIn, and you're adding value, if you if you like and comment on something that someone posts, and you're genuine about it, a couple of times before you send them a connection request, like, they're probably going to respond, and then you can connect and call them and leave voicemail, you know, or whatever, right, right from LinkedIn. That's, that's definitely the easiest way I've found lately where, you know, after COVID nobody's in, nobody's in the office anymore. Tell me about your work coaching, uh, sales development reps, business development reps and account executives. Yeah, it, it kind of came about, uh, started really organically where I was just kind of mentoring people in in the organizations I've been a part of that were, um, you know, ha, uh, you know, that were new. And I was, because I was very lucky to have people that were willing to do that for me. And so just kind of, I can't pay those people back that I can pay it forward. And then, um, as I, as I kind of got more, um, traction and more kind of visibility writing on LinkedIn, people, uh, would reach out to me. So yeah, I've been coaching people for a number of years and it's, it's really, it's not, I don't have a, I don't have a course. I don't have a curriculum. It's really like we get together when they, um, on their schedule, whether it's once a month or once a week. And we just go over like, Hey, this is, this is the problem I'm having. I haven't gotten any product training or I've asked my boss for help and they haven't helped me with how to prospect in my territory. And so we, it's just, we just go over, um, you know, the things that they're needing help with. And I make some suggestions and I, send along I suggest like resources books podcasts and stuff that have helped me and um, just try to help them I get a little further along I think I think most people in sales think that their manager is going to do a lot of coaching for them and uh, that is rarely the case Hmm. what are some of your tips on you know when you're coaching people about how to when to reach out is there a good time of day to do that uh, maybe it depends on the method. Should you try to, you know, call people's cell phone or send them a LinkedIn uh, voice memo at a certain time of day or uh, day of the week? Um, I like sending people things at times where they are not likely to be as busy or where they're where my message is not in competition with a lot of other things. So 
And that part of that comes from whenever I was working at, a, at Outreach, which is a, a tech company that um, it, it has a lot of data around when the t- best times to reach out are. And as I looked at the data, executives were responding to and reading and responding to emails um, in the evenings and like on Sunday afternoons. And so I started then scheduling uh, my emails and messages to, go- I, I would never, I would never call someone. <laughs> I would never like call someone cell phone that I didn't know, didn't have a relationship with on the on the weekend for sure. Uh, but as far as like written communication, email messages, LinkedIn messages, I like to send those like after like 7 p.m. Uh, during the week, and then like Sunday, like early Sunday afternoon, because that's when executives are sitting down to plan their week and and they're not rushing from meeting to meeting like they are Monday through Friday. What about your LinkedIn posts? You've clearly experimented quite a bit and found a, a winning formula. Is there a day or time during the week that you find has gotten the best responses? Um, there's lots of different kind of like schools of thought about that. Um, and yeah, I've definitely done a lot of experimenting with it. Um, I post mine in people that I am like that connect with my stuff. Generally, it's pretty like early in the morning during the weekday and I will and then also a lot of times like on Saturday so I post during the week like like three days a week in the early morning I don't find much engagement on LinkedIn on a Friday uh, Monday is hit or miss so I usually do Tuesday through Friday uh, Tuesday through Thursday mornings on LinkedIn and sometimes one on Saturday um, and on Saturday uh, it's, it's amazing how many people are are right there again because they're not in their work email but maybe they're like trying to they're looking for content they're trying to find something that's going to help them you know in their job during the week and what have you learned about the importance of engaging with their engagement so if someone comments about replying or commenting on their comment yeah uh, that's one of the one of the first things they'll teach you in Um, any course, any good course that you take on LinkedIn, which is um, the algorithm is picking up engagement. So as soon as someone comments, you want to immediately um, engage and reply to their comment and to, and ideally do so in a way um, that, that creates like further um, engagement, further discussion where you, you know, if they comment and they, you know, say something, then you can ask, well, okay, you know, thanks for, you know, thanks for the kind words about, you know, what I just posted, like, what would you add? Because mo- people love to give advice and people are really smart and they've picked up, you know, a nugget or two that they can share. And so, you know, asking a question that invites them to, you know, go a little further or um, is is definitely going to get your your stuff, your content out there more and more because I think it's pretty well known that the LinkedIn algorithm definitely, definitely favors engagement the more engagement um your content gets the more people their linkedin is going to put it in front of um, because it that that keeps eyeballs on their platform right it's that's what serves their business model and what have you learned about the importance of kind of focusing in on a sort of given topic area versus kind of posting randomly on all the different topics did you find that you when you're posting on given topic area and narrowed in on that that you started to go deeper and get that consistent repeated engagement from a dedicated audience yeah i I think yeah it's exactly that i think you have to start you're going to start by doing a lot of experimentation and you're going to start by going pretty wide a lot of times and then and then you kind of let the engagement data speak to you and it'll be pretty clear like if you get no engagement like people are or low engagement like people are not you know interested in that topic or they're not you know they didn't find value in the way that i presented it versus you know obviously if something takes off you're like oh this is this is a big pain point so there are there's definitely there's a couple of tools out there also that i mean you you can kind of eyeball it you know um but there's some that go a little more specifically into like which if you post a lot like which post gets the most engagement but yeah you just have to it'll be pretty clear, like from just from the engagement numbers, what, what people are interested in hearing about and talking about. And then also frequently, if people are kind enough to, to message me directly and say what helped them, I will also ask them, 
like this, you know, so nice. Thank you for doing that. Um, what other things would you be interested in, in seeing, um, would love your advice. And again, people love to get, get advice. And a lot of times early career people are, are really hungry for anything that can help them. And they have, I've gotten people send me like six paragraphs, like here's, here's all the things I want help with. Tell us about those uh, tools that you mentioned to help monitor engagement. Um, so there's, um, there is a company called Shield Analytics that is specifically for LinkedIn that will slice and dice your engagement data. Um, I'm, it's a subscription, and uh, it will it will definitely um, help you really pick up on on trends. Um, and I found it super helpful. Um, and then in the Ship Thirty course, they have a product called TypeShare, which lets you um, create like a content library so that you can go back to it. Because that's one of the hard things actually about if you're writing on LinkedIn or Twitter, it's really hard to have a concise uh, or one central place where all of your content lives. And so Type TypeShare has been very helpful for that. And TypeShare will measure your engagement metrics, not on LinkedIn, unfortunately, but it will do it for Twitter. And so if, if you're writing on Twitter and, and you want to measure um, engagement, it, that's one of the tools that will measure it. There may be others. That's, that's just one I'm aware of. Kristen, if listeners wanted to contact you and find out more about your work, where would you point them online? Yeah, they can um, get on my LinkedIn profile, and that it also uh, links to um, the website for my coaching practice. But the, the website for my coaching pr- practice is Crosscuts. Dot io. Um, crosscuts is a is an old word for shortcuts, and so I, I like to think that I'm helping people and giving give them the shortcuts that I wish I'd had very early on in my sales career. Fantastic, listeners. If we will include those links in the show notes, so check there. Follow up with Kristen if you want to learn more about her work, and if you are so inclined to give this show a five star review on iTunes, it does help others discover the show. Kristen, it's been fabulous speaking with you. Congrats on all the success you've had building up a a really amazing audience and producing excellent content. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk with you. It's been really fun.